Well, good morning, church. Great to see you. Uh, my name is Brady Goodwin. I have the joy of serving as one of the pastors here. The privilege of opening God's word with you this morning. We are continuing our series in the book of Genesis, and I'll invite you to turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 29. We're going to be looking this morning at Genesis 29, verse 31, all the way through Genesis 30, verse 24. And so we'll read this text And then we'll jump in. Genesis 29, verse 31. God's word says this. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. And Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben, for she said, Because the Lord has looked upon my affliction, for now my husband will love me. She conceived again and bore a son and said, Because the Lord has heard that I am hated, he has given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. Again, she conceived and bore a son and said, Now this time my husband will be attached to me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore, his name was called Levi. And she conceived again and bore a son and said, this time I will praise the Lord. Therefore, she called his name Judah. Then she ceased bearing. When Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she envied her sister. She said to Jacob, give me children, or I shall die. Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel, and he said, am I in the place of God who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? Then she said, here is my servant Bilhah. Go into her so that she may give birth on my behalf, that even I may have children through her. So she gave him her servant Bilhah as a wife, and Jacob went into her. And Bilhah conceived and bore Jacob a son. Then Rachel said, God has judged me and has also heard my voice and given me a son. Therefore, she called his name Dan. Rachel's servant Bilhah conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. Then Rachel said, with mighty wrestlings, I have wrestled with my sister and have prevailed. So she called his name Naphtali. When Leah saw that she had ceased bearing children, she took her servant Zilpah and gave her to Jacob as a wife. Then Leah's servant Zilpah bore Jacob a son. And Leah said, good fortune has come. So she called his name Gad. Leah's servant Zilpah bore Jacob a second son. And Leah said, happy am I, for women have called me happy. So she called his name Asher. In the days of wheat harvest, Reuben went and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But she said to her, is it a small matter that you have taken away my husband? Would you take away my son's mandrakes also? Rachel said, Then he may lie with you tonight in exchange for your son's mandrakes. When Jacob came from the field in the evening, Leah went out to meet him and said, You must come into me, for I have hired you with my son's mandrakes. So he lay with her that night. And God listened to Leah, and she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. Leah said, God has given me my wages because I gave my servant to my husband. So she called his name Issachar. And Leah conceived again and she bore Jacob a sixth son. Then Leah said, God has endowed me with a good endowment. Now my husband will honor me because I have borne him six sons. So she called his name Zebulun. Afterward, she bore a daughter and called her name Dinah. Then God remembered Rachel, and God listened to her and opened her womb. 
She conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. And she called his name Joseph, saying, may the Lord add to me another son. This is the word of the Lord. I don't know if you've noticed this, but when you go through a hard time, when you suffer, certain desires always seem to show up as well. We are faced with a hardship and what we want most or perhaps what we most fear naturally rises to the surface. It's inevitable. When you are cut, what's inside of you comes out. And whether confronted with loss, financial difficulty, mistreatment by others, in all of these circumstances and more, suffering and our desires just seem to go together. Strange as it sounds, given how many babies are born in this passage, this text is about suffering and desire as well. Did you notice? We have Leah longing for Jacob's love, but never receiving it. And we have Rachel yearning for children, but remaining childless until the very end of the narrative. And we have the challenges that come when we try to intervene, but with few or diminishing returns. I bet a lot of us can relate. As we look more closely at this passage, I want us to notice three themes and one promise. First, we're going to see God's mercy when we suffer. How God's compassion is evident in the story of Leah, but also of Rachel. Second, we are going to observe God's sovereignty in difficulty, how God is at work, even when things are painful in our lives. And third, we'll look at how God is redeeming the brokenness that we face how his redemptive purposes play out even when we can't fully understand them in the moment. And then finally, we will consider how all of these themes come together through the promise of the good news of Jesus Christ. So we're gonna look at God's mercy in our suffering, God's sovereignty over our suffering, God's redemption through our suffering and the promise of the gospel. And so first, let's think about God's mercy in our suffering. Notice the first phrase of our text in Genesis 29, 31. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated. You may remember last week, we read how Leah was presented to Jacob by Leah's father Laban through deceitful means. Jacob had worked for Laban for seven years for Rachel. But on the wedding night, Laban and likely Leah as well, conspired against Jacob to present Leah as Jacob's wife. In light of this deception, it's not terribly surprising to read at the conclusion of that passage that Jacob, after the wedding, loved Rachel more than Leah and served Laban for another seven years. But God saw Leah. In the same way that God saw the suffering of his people Israel in Exodus 2, 24 and 25, he saw the plight of Leah. In Exodus 2, we read this, God heard the groaning of his people Israel and God remembered the covenant that he'd made with Abraham, with Isaac and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel and God knew. God would see Israel's suffering centuries later, but he saw Leah's struggle as well. And in response, we see that he opened her womb. But notice as well the description of Rachel's barrenness at the end of this verse. Right away, we are introduced to the main conflict of this narrative. Leah was unloved by Jacob, but God saw her position and opened her womb. Rachel, though cherished by Jacob, remained at least for a time without children. Now, if you've endured suffering in your life, you probably see something familiar in Leah's and Rachel's circumstances. The seasons of suffering that we face are not monolithic. They're not the same. They ebb and flow. There are moments of joy punctuated by the struggles of human life and difficult circumstances that are buttressed by times of peace. But what's also true 
and more clearly seen in this text is that when we suffer, our desires, whatever their object may be, naturally rise to the surface. We see this in verses 32 through 35. Leah conceives. Notice that Jacob is not named, more clearly highlighting God's work in her life. And Leah gives birth to four sons. And like many other places in Scripture, the children here are named in accordance with the circumstances of their births. For Leah, the names correspond to her desire for Jacob's love. Reuben sounds like the Hebrew word for affliction. Simeon sounds like the verb heard. And Levi, the noun, attached. Leah names her children on the hopes that because God saw her affliction, because he heard that she was hated, and because she had borne Jacob many children, that Jacob would respond with love. And in this section, only Judah's name differs As Leah says, this time I will praise the Lord. We don't know fully whether or not these prayers of naming led to her desired outcome, that Jacob would love her as he loved Rachel. And that might actually lead us to think, well, was God merciful to Leah? Seeing that nothing is said of Jacob's response to Leah's fertility and her desires for his love. But look back at verse 31 once more. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb. This statement is key. The Hebrew would be more naturally translated as, and the Lord saw that Leah was hated and he opened her womb. But the effect is the same. God opened Leah's womb in response to her second class status in Jacob's home. Because she was unloved, God displayed his mercy. Was his mercy conditioned on Leah's desires? No, it was conditioned upon his love for her and his recognition of her situation. Whether or not Leah's desires for Jacob's love are fully satisfied in this text, God was merciful to her in her suffering. That distinction may feel a little subtle at first, but is crucial to us understanding the heart of God in our own suffering. When we experience suffering, it is difficult for us to see beyond the immediate circumstances we are facing. And because we respond to our trials from the wellspring of our hearts, we naturally look to what we value in pursuit of relief. And of course, those values are not always wrong. When you receive hard news, you naturally want relief. And sometimes God gives us what we most long for. We hear news that we so desperately want to come. Your cancer is in remission. Your child is going to make it. You are going to be okay and praise God when that happens. When this happens, it's an amazing display of God's kindness and love. These graces are to be cherished to the praise of God's glory. But at the same time, our longings do not always come to pass as we would have them occur. Why? Because God is real. He is not some force that we can manipulate or pray into our service. He is the Lord, the three in one, Father, Son, and Spirit, three persons, one essence. He has a will that he intends to see accomplished and a heart that is expressed in his dealings with us and the world he created. He is not beholden to our desires, but he acts freely according to his. But he is loving and he is gracious and fatherly in his actions and most importantly, he is good. And so we see in the case of Leah that he saw that she was unloved and he opened her womb. He was merciful and compassionate, and he acted. We don't know what Jacob's response was, and we don't need to know completely to be able to say that God was merciful to Leah. He saw her suffering, and he moved. Now, of course, to say that God is merciful 
apart from Leah's desires for Jacob's love being fulfilled, that kind of statement is heresy in our modern culture. So shaped as it is by the worldview known as expressive individualism, the belief that we must live by and pursue our uncorrected assumptions and desires in order to live a truly authentic and meaningful life. But here too is one of God's kindnesses. He helps us by his word and through our experiences with him to see a different way of interpreting our lives. Whether Leah's desires from her point of view were satisfied, whether or not those were fulfilled, it doesn't deny God's love for her and his perfect mercy in her situation. Whether God does what you want from an earthly point of view doesn't mean that he hasn't acted with love towards you. His love is not dependent upon our initial interpretation of his actions. Instead, his love has the power to change our perspective so that we begin to understand more of his work and just how limited our point of view actually is. And as God was merciful with Leah, so too is he merciful in our suffering. But it is not just his mercy that we see in this text. We also see God's sovereignty over our suffering, which we want to now consider. So we talked about God's mercy in our suffering. Let's think about God's sovereignty over our suffering. And so just as God saw Leah in Genesis 29, 31, in Genesis 30, verse one, we read that when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she envied her sister. The structure in the Hebrew is the same as the beginning of our passage. And God saw that Leah was hated and he opened her womb. And Rachel saw that she bore no children and she envied her sister. Notice again, the expression of desire. Earlier, Leah desired Jacob's love. And here, Rachel desires Leah's fertility. However, envy implies more than just desire, doesn't it? Envy involves desire plus discontentment. Envy shows up any time that we look at another's circumstances and say to ourselves, because that is not my situation, I am incomplete, insufficient, or unsatisfied. I must have what they have in order to be okay. Now, of course, the desire for children, like the kind of longing that we saw with Jacob or Leah's desire for Jacob, is not to be discarded simply because of its potential to become distorted. Desiring a family is something that mirrors the heart of God. It is a good desire to be upheld. What we want to notice, however, is the way that Rachel's desires inform her perspective on her situation and how this perspective shapes her words and her actions. In the second half of Genesis 30, verse one, we see that Rachel says to Jacob, give me children or I shall die. Now, usually a rightly held desire is something that we can do without and still maintain some sense of composure. Even if painful, we can entrust the desire to God, knowing that he is good and that he is at work. But at other times, to relinquish our desires in this way is much more difficult. We struggle with maintaining a right perspective, with seeing God's hand at work, even when something we want remains out of reach. This is what is happening here with Rachel. She looks to Jacob, and in her desperation, she says, give me children or I'm dead. This plea, though ostensibly focused on her desire for children, What's it really about? It's really about her longing for a different life, a life that mirrors Leah's abundance. Notice as well the absence of any appeal to the Lord. Where God saw Leah's situation earlier here, the point of view is limited to Rachel alone. And whether we have been in Rachel's exact situation or not, there is something eminently relatable for us all in her struggle. She is struggling against her circumstances, but she's looking for help from the wrong person. Jacob, for his part, falls prey to an age-old husband trap. 
He says something that is technically true, but offered at the wrong time and in the wrong way. How many times have you, in a spirit of righteous indignation or from a place of perceived rightness, looked upon someone else in your life who is struggling with anger, irritation, or annoyance? Or when someone blames us for their difficult circumstances, how many times have you thrown your hands up in exasperation and say, well, it's not my fault. And so we can read this separated from the immediacy of these events and we can say, watch out, Jacob. But if we examine our own lives and we're honest, we'll see the same tendency. We can readily recognize the truth of a given situation in someone else's life, but struggle with applying that truth in a spirit of love and help. Instead of ministering the heart of God, which we've seen is merciful and loving, we deflect and accuse, or we imply that it's really the other person's fault that they are in the situation they're in. And though it is articulated differently, Jacob here is just as nearsighted as Rachel, where she feels the desperation of her situation and appeals to Jacob. Jacob is more concerned with defending himself in the moment rather than to consider the larger picture. But underneath Jacob's response, there is a truth that must be considered if we are to really understand the theological importance of this text. And that truth is this, God is sovereign over the entire episode. He's in control, he is at work. Though improperly applied, Jacob is correct in his assertion that it is not he, but God who is in control. It is God who grants the gift of children and not men. God's sovereignty, his purposeful working in history and in individual human lives, that teaching can be a very thorny thing to grapple with in scripture. Both because of our deeply held cultural notions about personal autonomy, but also in light of the very real freedom and agency that we possess as human beings, it can be challenging for us to consider that it is actually God who is in control of all things and not us. It feels like an incompatible reality that we would be able to choose and to make decisions that carry real impact on our situation, but that there is also a God who is sovereignly guiding all of history in redemptive and glorious ways. Yet, think about the inconsistency of that logic. When things are going well for you, we're not really troubled by questions of God's sovereignty. We celebrate God's kindness, and rightly so. Every good and perfect gift indeed comes from him. And even if there is a strain of self-glorification in it, it's usually muted by the overall gladness that we feel in seasons of abundance, of plenty, or of favor. But take away the favor. Threaten it or remove it, and you're faced with a problem. If God is sovereign over the good, is he not also in control of situations that are hard, painful, or difficult? The truth is that he must be sovereign over all or he is sovereign over none. We would never want a God who is not able to intervene in our pain, who is not completely at work in our suffering. And yet, so often, this is actually what we imply when we blame God or others for our difficulties or we seek to take matters into our own hands apart from trusting him with our circumstances. And so what follows next in this text is an example of the interweaving of God's sovereignty but also of human efforts to achieve a desired circumstantial outcome. Rachel gives to Jacob her servant Bilhah, who was first mentioned in our preceding passage. He gives her to him as a wife. 
Bilhah conceives two children whom Rachel names according to her interpretation of the sequence of events. Dan, whose name echoes the Hebrew term for vindication. And Naphtali, whose name sounds like the word for wrestling. From Rachel's point of view, God has vindicated her and has given her victory over her sister Leah. But not to be outdone, Leah follows suit. Genesis 30 verse 9 begins just as the two preceding sections do. Back in 2931, God saw Leah. 30 verse 1, Rachel saw that Leah had conceived. And now Leah in verse 9, she saw that she no longer bore children. And she responded. In verses 9 through 13, Leah gives her servant Zilpah, who was also named in that prior narrative. She gives her to Jacob, and two more sons are born. We see Gad and Asher, who are so named for the perceived favor and happiness that resulted from Leah's good fortune. However, the primary example of this interplay between God's sovereign working and human action comes beginning in chapter 30, verse 14. Verse 14 begins a new subsection in the narrative where we read that in the days of wheat harvest, Reuben went and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother, Leah. It does not appear that these are the Harry Potter kind of mandrakes that scream when you pull them out of the ground. But it does appear that in the ancient world, mandrakes like this, the real ones, were thought to represent a kind of homeopathic fertility treatment. So it's not too surprising to see Rachel come to Leah and ask her, please give me some of Reuben's mandrakes. She is still looking for children of her own and now approaches Leah for assistance. But Leah's response reveals that despite God's blessing through children, her desires for Jacob have not yet been fully satisfied. She says, is it a small matter that you have taken away my husband? Would you take away my son's mandrakes also? In other words, what more do you want, Rachel? You already have Jacob and now you want my children? In response, Rachel offers up her conjugal rights with Jacob. So she sees, we see Leah approach Jacob in verse 16 And as a result of that union, another son, Issachar, is born, whose name means wages. From Leah's point of view, she has received her rightful wages for all that she's done. And she will ultimately bear two more children in this passage. First is Zebulun, whose name describes Leah's hope for honor from Jacob, and then a daughter, Dinah. And we don't learn anything about the etymology of Dinah's name, but her story will come later in Genesis chapter 34. But what are we to make of what's happening here? Earlier, we discussed God's sovereignty, that he is in control, that he is providentially working in all things. And yet this sovereign working occurs through the actions of people, even when human motivations are suspect. So the question we have to ask is, does that make him complicit in the complex and broken decisions that people make in their lives. And to answer that question, you and I have to take a step away from the immediacy of one person's life and to consider the larger sweep of history. Even if we take the specific example of bearing children and families that are begun, we will see that God is at work behind the scenes in ways that you and I could never know in the moment, but which we clearly see as we begin to survey the whole. And so let me ask you, how many of you have divorce in your family history? How many of you have experienced, whether directly or indirectly, the conception of a child outside of marriage? How many of you have relationships in your family that have been the source of much pain and brokenness in your life? How many of you have experienced loss in your family in ways that deeply impacted your own life? And yet, you are here. If your parents are still living, they are here. If you have children, your children are here. If you have siblings, they are here. 
If I think about my own story, all of the above scenarios, divorce, sexual brokenness, abusive relationships, death, all are a direct part of my lineage. And yet, God in his kindness has led me to him. If I remove any chapter of my story, I cannot guarantee that the same outcome would have resulted. God has been at work in every new turn, guiding and leading in his mercy and in his sovereignty. He has been at work in your life in the same way. It doesn't mean that our decisions are of no consequence today. We are still accountable to God for what we do. But it, it does mean that he is at work in everything. So in our text, we have seen how God is merciful in our suffering, but also how God is sovereign over our suffering. What I wanna now do is see how God brings redemption through our suffering. So look at verse 22. After all that has happened in this text, now in Genesis 30, 22, we see God reappear in the narrative. Then God remembered Rachel and God listened to her and opened her womb. Notice the parallel between this verse and Genesis 29, 31. And the Lord saw Leah and he opened her womb and God remembered Rachel and he listened to her and opened her womb. The result was the birth of Rachel's son, Joseph. Joseph's name is both a response and a plea. It could refer to the Lord taking away Rachel's reproach, but it can also point to her plea for another child, a plea that would ultimately be answered through the birth of Benjamin in Genesis 35. And in this text, what we see are at least two ways to understand the redeeming work of God. The first is temporal or circumstantial. God blesses Leah and Rachel, working his mercy and sovereignty despite both the frustrated longings and the relational conflict that we see in this passage. Whether both women's desires were fully realized, as we have said, is uncertain though there seems to be an indication that Jacob did in fact come to honor and respect Leah as we saw last week. And whatever the case, we see in real time God giving the gift of children to each as a display of his grace. And at times you and I will find ourselves the beneficiaries of positive outcomes to our suffering as well. Sometimes things will turn out. What we want will come to pass. And as we said before, we rightly celebrate God's kindness in such circumstances because they are gifts from him. But in other circumstances, we will see our desires left unmet. Our hopes may remain unfulfilled. And it's okay in those moments for us to feel the sting when such longings go unsatisfied. It's okay to lament these things and to pour out our hearts before God. It's okay for us to do this so long as we reconcile our circumstances with our awareness of the mercy and sovereignty of God. And so long as he remains a refuge for us rather than an adversary. But the way that we can actually reconcile that seeming disparity when things don't go our way, that comes through the second way that we see God redeeming suffering in this text. This way of redemption is spiritual and salvific. Here's what I mean. Leah and Rachel are going through this prolonged conflict born out of their competing desires. And we notice that in the way they respond to their varied sufferings, we can see how focused they are on the temporal nature of their longings. But all along, God is doing something. Long ago, God promised to Abraham that Abraham would be the father of a great nation. Yet for the first two generations that come after Abraham, we only see a small handful of descendants, first from Abraham and then from Isaac. Isaac. 
But now with Jacob, we have in one fell swoop, 12 children in this narrative alone, not including Benjamin who will come in just a few years. Virtually overnight, we see the foundation laid for the entire nation of Israel. 12 descendants here with many more to follow. What Leah and Rachel couldn't know, nearsighted as they were, was that through their conflict, God was producing the forebears of the people of Israel. Their stories were part of something so much greater. I don't know what hardship you have faced. Some of you have already walked through the fire. And yet for others, pain and loss are mostly an abstraction for you. But wherever you find yourselves, I want you to know that like Leah and Rachel, God intends to work redemption in your story as well. He intends to work in ways that you can't see right now so that he may produce something that you would never want to do without. And that leads us to our final point. We've discussed how God shows his mercy in our suffering. We've seen how God is sovereign over our suffering and how God brings redemption through our suffering. But this is all leading to the promise that holds the key to how we interpret this text and every text in scripture and our very lives in light of the glorious grace of Jesus Christ. And so earlier we looked at the first four sons that were born to Leah. Leah. And how the explanation, we saw how the explanation for one of those sons, Judah, but the explanation for his name differed from the others. The first three all had names connected to Leah's desires, but Judah's name reflected God's praise. Now, as we will learn in the coming weeks, Judah was not a perfect man, but his story, like all of the other stories of the people we see in scripture, That story was part of the unfolding picture of God's saving work that has been part of the thread of human history from its very beginning. Ultimately, we will learn that Judah's life was like a small tributary flowing into a larger river. His life would be joined to many others with each playing its part in creating the cascading narrative of redemption that would one day find its fullest expression in a man born of Judah's line, Jesus of Nazareth, born to Mary by the power of the Holy Spirit, God in the flesh. Jesus' life too would be a reflection of all of the ways that God works in his sovereignty in his mercy and his redemption, except that Jesus would also become the means by which these things could be known in my life and in your life. Like Leah, Jesus was hated by others and suffered wrong. He was put to death in our place, but his suffering was so that we could be forgiven of all of the envy, all of the anger, and all of the misplaced longings that reveal a heart that doesn't love or trust God, but instead seeks to live for ourselves. And like Leah and Rachel, Jesus' story ends in restoration. Jesus didn't stay dead, but he was resurrected. And through his life, he now offers salvation to any who would call on him by faith. Your story and my story, they are deeply reflective of God's mercy and his sovereignty. He's been at work in your life at every stage so that you might see how your journey is meant to align with the coming of Christ, such that every piece fits perfectly as part of God's mission to save a people for himself. But apart from faith in Christ, our stories will not end in redemption they will end in further frustration, futility, and ultimately judgment for our sins. 
Such is the story of any who do not know and love Jesus Christ, the one whose sinless life, substitutionary death, and glorious resurrection provide the way of salvation for those who believe. But in Jesus Christ, this offer, it means that your story, with all of its intricate weaving of interconnected events, that that story can also have the redemptive edge it was always meant to have. Through Christ, your story can head somewhere far more glorious than it could ever go when we just consider the different things that have happened to you and how they might reflect some broader narrative to your life. Through Christ, your story can also lead to resurrection, to the redeeming of all broken things, the fulfillment of every promise of God and the hope of every heart. I know that in this room, many, perhaps most of us, have learned to see how our lives reflect the working of God in every angle to lead us to salvation and life through Christ. But for those of you who are here who do not know this hope, or perhaps those of you who understand Christ's work but haven't considered its implications for your life in all of its different chapters, there is an opportunity for you today. You can believe that Jesus died for you, that he was resurrected, and that he offers the way of salvation that we so desperately needed. You can believe that all the stories of scripture find their fulfillment in Christ and that the same redemptive work is possible for your story and my story as they find their rightful place in his story. And if that's you, my appeal to you is that you would turn to Christ today and receive the gift of salvation. The promise of the gospel of Jesus, the promise of forgiveness, of redemption, of restoration. That promise is for you. And so through the story of Leah and Rachel, we've seen God's mercy and we have seen God's sovereignty and we have seen God's redemption. But most importantly, we have considered how all of these attributes point to the promise of the gospel of Jesus Christ and his power to transform our stories as well. So as we prepare to come to the Lord's table, let's pray that God would grant us the fresh reminder of his grace in our lives and in our own stories so that we might remember and proclaim his goodness to us through his son, Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word and for the way that it leads us to the hope that can be ours in Christ. I pray that you will help us to see in new ways this morning how our lives reflect your working and how the hope of Jesus gives our stories their truest meaning and fulfillment in you. I pray that you would lead those in this room who do not know you to trust in the work of your son so that they might receive your grace and love and that they too would experience the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. Help us now as we remember the basis of our salvation through the broken body and shed blood of our savior, Jesus Christ. I pray this in his name, amen.